Don't make too much out of this. For your own sake, Mr. Quinlan. She squeezed my hand. I felt... All right, all right. Let's say she did. It could have been anything. An involuntary muscle spasm in her hand or yours. Perhaps a reaction to the respirator forcing air into her lungs. It could have been your imagination. Maybe you wanted her to squeeze your hand so bad... Yeah, and maybe she's getting better. Maybe she's getting stronger. Mr. Quinlan, your daughter has been in a coma for almost 12 weeks now. And every time you think you see some new improvement, we have the same conversation, sir. Karen has gone from 120 pounds to 70. The brain scans, the EEGs, the angiograms show no improvement, no positive sign. We tried weaning her from the respirator and that failed. She's not getting better. She's not growing stronger. Please understand. Understand what? Nothing can be done. I don't understand that. I can't understand that at all. Now, someplace, somewhere, there's got to be an answer. Not in medicine, Mr. Quinlan, not to my knowledge. I see no way that your daughter's condition can be reversed. What you're looking for, sir, is a miracle. And that's not my field. It's his. But even if he were to get your miracle, even if Karen were to stabilize right now, today, you'd never have your daughter back. Not the way you remember her, not the way you loved her. Her brain cells don't regenerate. She'd live like a vegetable in an institution the rest of her life. Now that, Mr. Quinlan, that is what you have to understand. I'm glad you came out of the elevator when you did, Father. I have patience to see you. Uh, I'll stay with you. Thank you. There's no hope, Mr. Quinlan. No miracles. Karen Ann will die. Mercifully sooner than later. I'm sorry, but it's time you came to that realization. Your wife has. Your parish priest has. Perhaps now you will, finally. God loves her too much, Father. He's not going to let her die. Maybe because he loves her so much, he will. I don't care about the way she'll be, Father. I don't care if she has to spend the rest of her life in this hospital. I just don't want her dead. I love her too much. I know that, Joe. I know. But there's another question. There's another side to be considered. Karen was a girl blessed with the love of life. Well, he was a vibrant. She made it so. You know what's the worst thing about religion, Father? Go. No. What's that? It's dull. <laughs> you know, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> when I think about her, it's with laughter, vitality, happy. Would she be happy with her life now, the way it is? Couldn't a girl like Karen receive death as she did life? Full face. As a blessing. Joe, you want me to stay with you? No, I'm all right. I just want to be alone with her a while. Uh, I'm okay. What happened? Uh, they, they've got her in one of the emergency rooms. She just stopped breathing. We were at the floodlighter. We only had just a couple it of drinks. It was my birthday. We were celebrating. And then we went back to our place, and Karen went into the bedroom. We found her on the bed later. She wasn't breathing. Uh, nothing. I, I gave her mouth to mouth. I, I just couldn't get her to breathe again. At first we thought she was dead, but then the ambulance came, and they were... Are you the Quinlan's? Yes. Where is she? She's in there. Uh, you can go in in a minute. What's wrong with her? We don't know yet. They didn't give us much to go on. Maybe you can give us some help. She had a fall recently, a blow to the head, anything like that. No. Well, we're not sure she doesn't live home anymore. But 
How about medication, prescription drugs for asthma, weight control, and... She's been dieting lately. She's planning a trip to Florida. We found Valium in her handbag. Valium? Did she ever take anything stronger than that? No. She wouldn't do that to her body. She's a very athletic girl. She wouldn't take drugs. She wasn't into that. Either way, it doesn't make any difference. No one was on anything tonight. Can I see her? She's in a comatose condition. Now, I wish we knew what caused that because it's hard to treat coma blindly. We need your permission to perform a tracheotomy. We don't know what that means. We have to cut an air passage in her throat in order to place her on a respirator that will breathe for her. The endotracheal tube that's attaching her to the respirator now is not as efficient. Well, yeah, sure. If you don't even, if you can't figure out what's wrong with her, how are you going to help? I'd like to have her transferred to St. Clair's Hospital. They have more sophisticated equipment and are able to give more extensive tests. Do it. Father Tom came by the house. He said you talked. Yeah. Are you all right? I'm scared, Julie. Suppose it happened. You faced that a long time ago, didn't you? Yes. But you never talked to me about it. I tried to once. At the department store. You weren't ready to listen. Well, I'm not ready now. I can't face it. I can't even think about it, Dad. You want me to stay with you? No, I have to put it all together myself. I have to... I have to just do it alone with her. I'll wait up for you. I'd like to have her transferred to St. Clair's Hospital. To St. Clair's Hospital. To St. Clair's Hospital. <laughs> it is not unusual itself. A motor reaction, just a response to the new machine. Tell her about this when she comes out of it. Karen loves spooking people. 
When I tell her how she's scared us all sitting up like that, she'll laugh her head off. Although I'll continue to retain primary responsibility for Karen's overall care, I've placed her in Dr. Hanif's hands while she's on the respirator. He's our pulmonary specialist. Now, as to what caused the coma, we've run batteries of every test available to us and still can't be certain. Could have been a combination of Valium, liquor, and dieting. It could have been something lodged in her throat. Perhaps her own vomit. It could have been very many different things. And no one can be certain how long Karen stopped breathing, how long she went without oxygen. But there are certain things that are becoming very clear to us. Look at her left foot. It's turned in. We, uh... We think she suffered a fair amount of brain damage. Just how much brain damage has occurred, we're not sure. We're not even sure at this point whether, in fact, the deterioration has stopped. We need time. Time. We need time. Time. Keeping you up. No, I just can't sleep. Mom? Yes. I'm not going back to the hospital. I don't want to see her like that anymore. It's not Karen. That person lying up there is not my sister. I can't see her anymore. I'm sorry. I understand. Do me a favor, Mary Ellen, find another song. I'm sorry, it got on your nerves. I was thinking about Karen, I guess it was just automatic. The doctors could be wrong. What? Well, maybe she won't die, maybe she'll get better. Then we'll be the way we were. Everyone will go down to the seashore. Maybe. I don't really believe that, do you? I don't know what I believe anymore. Well, they were wrong about you. They told you you could never have kids, and so you adopted Karen. Two years later, you had me and then John. Well, they can get their heads messed up just like anyone else. Doctors aren't gods. But God is God. And he'll decide whether we all go down to the seashore. Go to bed, dear. When is Dad coming home? Soon. He said soon. You want that for Karen? It's a good value. Come Christmas time, it's liable to be twice as much the way things are going. We'll take it. No, I don't want it. Why not? She'd love that. Joe. 
Karen may not be here for Christmas. She may be dead by Christmas. Julie, don't you ever say that to me again. I don't want to hear that again from you. Ever. in the war, Daddy? Is that the way you mean? Something like that. Come on, little girl. Third time. I don't know how you stayed awake this long. But I wanted to stay with Clifford. I wanted to watch over him. Somebody else is going to take your place and watch over Clifford. He's in God's hand now. New day again, little girl. I can't stand watch over you anymore. I can't hang on to you alone. God's on duty now. I accept that. I think I think I made my peace with Karen God help me I think I made peace with myself You were right Julie She's gonna die isn't she And then it shouldn't be on that machine she hates that thing, I know it, I can see it in her face. She tightens up sometimes when that air is pumped into her. You suppose she's in pain? Think about it. What? It's been so lonely without you. these thoughts in my head, not being able to share them. Thank you for being with me again. What are we going to do?
At first I prayed. The doctors would bring her back. And then I prayed for a miracle. Now all I want is for Karen to be free. She's not with me, she's not with us, she's not with God. She's with pipes and valves and things stuck into her. Nobody knows what she suffers. Only a Lord. I want her to be with him, Joe. I don't want her to be imprisoned anymore. I want her soul to be free. The doctor said it. He said we should take her off that thing. We would be merciful. If she has to leave us, it should be a natural death with dignity, not, not all hooked up to that machine. I think we should talk to the doctors. Julie. Are we playing with God? God will make the decision whether she dies or not. Not us. God will make the decision. it over amongst the family and with Father Tom and we all agree with Dr. Hanif's recommendation. We'd like to have Karen taken off the respirator. You understand what you're asking? Yes. Karen would not survive. If we left her on the respirator, for how long would she survive? A while. I can't really be sure for just how long. I understand your question and more honestly, the answer is that her condition is beyond hope. She will not improve. You agree with that, Dr. Mason? Yes, I do. Now, uh, this is a Catholic hospital. And well, that's why I'm here, Dr. Mason. In an address given by Pope Pius XII in 1957, His Holiness states that extraordinary means are not necessary in order to preserve life when all hope is lost. The Quinlans have moral Catholic grounds in asking that the respirator be turned off. I, I think that the most important thing, what we want for Karen, is that she be returned to her natural state. We want it to be at peace, without interfering with the laws of nature. We want it to be in God's hands. I'm personally of the opinion that what you ask is the only merciful thing. It's a painful decision, I know. There are forms to be signed. We understand that. I like the powdered eggs, John. Are they powdered, Mom? <laughs> the way you eat and read at the same time, they could be anything. I'll tell you what. I'll pay more attention to the eggs if you take my test today. You're getting bees now. All I could get for you is a D plus. I'll take it. Hello? Oh, yes. Just, just a minute, Dr. Mason. He wants to talk with you, Dad. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mason? Yeah. Just a minute. It's not Karen. She's okay. Yes. Oh, sure, I understand what you're saying, doctor. Yeah, I know. Believe me, I sympathize. Is there anything I can do for you? Oh, sh yeah, sure, I'd agree to that. Uh -huh. Yeah, we'd all feel a, l a little more secure, I'm sure. Okay, okay, fine, we'll see you then. Goodbye. He's having some moral problems about taking Karen off the machine. Having a tough time with the decision. Now you understand. So what's he going to do? 
Well, he wants to call in uh, another man, um, some doctor who's a big specialist in the field, and if he agrees that Karen's chances of recovery are impossible, then Dr. Mason, he'll, he'll go through with it then. Just wants to be sure. Sounds reasonable. It's more than reasonable. What any dedicated doctor would do. Please call recovery room. Dr. Jerome Pingfield, call the recovery room. Pharmacist on call, please go to CCU, stat. Pharmacist on call, CCU, stat. Uh, we, uh... Well, we won't be able to carry out your wishes. I can't take your daughter off the respirator. He disagreed about Karen's condition? No, no, that's not it. He agrees with our prognosis. But you said if he agreed, then there wouldn't be any trouble. I know, I, uh... Well, the hospital administration and some of my colleagues have advised me against removing Karen from the respirator, and, uh... I agree. It would be against standard medical practice. But you... If you want to continue with this, you'll... You'll have to take it up with the hospital administration. I'm sorry. That's all I can tell you. What happened? I don't know. I'm going to find out. Dr. Campbell, please call the OR. Dr. Campbell. Good morning, Mrs. Hunt. This is Sister Mary Luke of our hospital board. Uh, Dr. Mason, you already know, as well as Dr. Hanif. Uh, this is Mr. Ted Einhorn, our legal counsel. I suppose we might as well get to the heart of the matter, if everyone is agreeable. Beyond all the other considerations involved, there are the legal questions. That's why Mr. Einhorn is here. I suppose it might be most expedient to turn the meeting over to him at the very beginning, since the legal position must be dealt with before any other. Mr. Einhorn? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure you're fully aware of what it is you ask this hospital to do. Legally, this has never been done before, and I must point out that the removal of a patient from a machine, such as a, a respirator, might be an act bordering on homicide. Obviously, the hospital must take into account every measure necessary to keep her alive. But it's not the hospital that takes it upon itself, it's the parents of the patient. who do not have that right. I don't understand you. Mr. Quinlan, Karen Ann is 21 and of legal age. You are no longer responsible for her under the law. You have no right to request any treatment or the discontinuance of treatment for her. You are not her guardian in the eyes of this hospital nor of the law. Wait, what about all these documents I've been signing? I mean, I, mean, I have to sign permission for uh, what, antibiotics and spinal taps and brain scans and all that. What about that? Now, you name it, I've had to sign it. If it was all right then, what about now? Well, that was different. How? That was to save a life. In this case, you want to do the opposite. I'd call that different. What are you saying? What do I have to do? You'll have to be named Karen's legal guardian by a court of law. But he's her father. He's not a stranger. He loves her. You people make it sound as if... It... We are not talking about love now, Mrs. Quinlan, but law. Well, if you're not talking about love, you're not talking about a good law. There's no good law that has no place for love. Who was her guardian when he cried endless nights? Where was your law? When the pain he felt was so deep, he dreamed of impossible cures. Fighting doctors who told him it was all hopeless. And now he comes to you with his heart in his hand, begging you to let his daughter die with dignity in God's way. How can you speak of guardianship? How do you dare speak of law? If I 
have to get legal guardianship, I will. After that, will you do as I ask? We'll talk again, Mr. Quinlan. After that. You understand I earn too much to qualify for legal aid. I'm not looking for a handout anyway. I went to the lawyers at the company where I work first in the shipping department, Warner Chilcott Pharmaceutical. But they only do corporate law, not, not trial work. So they told me that I should come to you people because maybe you could give me the name of somebody that could, could help me out. I mean, that's not going to charge me a, a whole year's salary. <laughs> hey, Notre Dame, that's a pretty good Catholic school. Being free of prejudice, I would agree with you. Mr. Quillen, I don't see that you have any problem. Any law firm can handle your case, and it shouldn't be very expensive at all. Uh, guardianship is a common enough petition in matters of real estate, wills, things of that nature. Well, this is a little bit different. See, my daughter is in coma, and she's on a machine, a respirator. And I want to get the guardianship so that I can force the hospital to take her off it might be a little more difficult in matters of real estate. See, this thing keeps her body alive, but just her body. And so we, if she has to die, then we want it to be able to die at peace. Quillen, there's a way you can save yourself a lot of trouble. Yeah, how? In the petition for guardianship, you might refrain from mentioning your purpose. You mean I shouldn't tell them that I want the guardianship so I can take her off the machine? That's right. Well, I want to do that. Thanks for your time. Just a minute, please. I'm not suggesting that you do that, Mr. Quillen. I merely wanted you to know that there's an easy way of going about it. But it's not the easy way for me. If I thought that it were, I wouldn't want to continue the conversation. Oh. Will you sit down, please? Yeah. face an almost impossible situation. I can't think of anyone who would take the case. I'd like to help you, but... Well, could you take it yourself? I can pay you. You could do it in your spare time. I'm afraid the people that employ me wouldn't take too kindly to that. Besides, this is the kind of case that would take a lot more than just spare time. Well, maybe... You think you could find a way? Give me Mr. Quillen. But you really don't understand what's involved. There's a job to lose, a wife to consider, an almost impossible uphill fight. I don't think there's a precedence for a case like this. It would mean tremendous legal research. Hospital records I would have to study. Enormous. Enormous. I don't see how I can do it. I don't see how I can not. Fascinating legal points this case could hinge on. Think of the fascinating financial points that eating hinges on. I only make $90 a week as an assistant librarian. I know. I know. <sighs> Ask them at legal aid if they'll make allowances in this case. 
I mean, maybe just one cell bend over backwards to really help someone. No way. I've already tried that route. It's a dead end. Oh, have you got any money on you? Eight bucks. We need a few things in the house. Like supper. She offered to pay. Wouldn't amount to much. Can't afford it, not really. Just like we can't afford to take a case, not really. I'll tell you what. I'll trade you the most important case of our lives for a box of Malamars. Means that much to you, eh? I suppose it does. You go to school all those years thinking that someday you're going to be trained enough to do something worthwhile for someone else. Something like this. I saw the Quillen go to the hospital. It was an experience. Now, if you're interested, he invited us to the hospital to meet with his wife. Come with me. And no commitment. After we meet them, then we can decide together. Either we're both 100% agreed, or we forget it. Deal? Put back the Valamars. How I did love you. Hello, darling. It's Mommy and Daddy. Oh, they washed your hair. Which shines so lovely. We brought some friends to see you. advantage if I ask you now? Do we take the case? Is it 100%? <sighs> Rest your case, counselor. You've won. Great. Now all we have to do is figure out how to live through it. I've already done that. I'll sell the AT&T stock my grandparents gave me. Hey, come on. I can't ask you to do that. You didn't. You know of another way? I think your grandparents might like the way we're putting their money to use. honored to serve as your attorney. Now, wait a minute. Wait just one minute. Before we go any further, I think you should know what may be coming. Oh, you said it was going to be a hard fight. We understand that. Forget the fight. Forget the fact that we may or may not win. You may be letting yourselves in for a great deal of trouble. There will be publicity on this thing. It'd be bad publicity. You could get a lot of hate mail calls. Friends and neighbors may turn against you and look upon you as the kind of people who are anxious to get rid of a stricken child. Paul, don't. No. It's better we all think about it now than later when we're committed. You and all your family could have a very bad time of it. Well, not as bad a time as Karen's having.
I'd like to file this complaint with the Superior Court, Chancery Division. Would you excuse me a minute? Sure. Is that your considered opinion, or does it come from higher up? Well, it makes no difference. You can't file it. I tell you what. You go back up those stairs to wherever it is you just came from, and tell them that if for some reason the complaint is inappropriate, a motion should be made on the record. Uh, look, it's Friday, and we're just about to close. Why don't you bring it back first thing Monday morning? I'll ask you one more time. Is the complaint inappropriate? Uh, the complaint is not inappropriate, no. Fine. Here's the filing fee. $60. Thank you. Good day. Uh, could you wait just a minute, please? Yes, hello. Uh, could you hold, please? Newark Star Ledger? Extension 1123, please. Hello, Stacy. Have I got a story for you? Julie! Uh, Mr. Quinlan, may we interview you and your family? What's this all about? Haven't you seen the headlines of your Saturday morning paper? No. Can I get through, please? Excuse me, please. I came over as soon as I saw my paper. I didn't think they'd get to you this fast. You people realize you're the first in the nation to go to court with such a legal petition? Yes, the Quinlans understand that. Um, would it be all right to come inside the house and photograph Karen's room? This is a big case, Mr. Quinlan. The whole country will want to know as much as they can about it. Is it the money, Mr. Quinlan? What? The bills from the hospital. Is it more than you can handle? Is that a reason you might have for taking Karen off the respirator? No. No, there are no bills. Hey, uh... Medicare is paying for everything. Dad, there's a telephone call. The man says he's from the UPI. Mrs. Quinlan, Mrs. Quinlan. Mrs. Quinlan, Mrs. Quinlan. Mrs. Quinlan. And so it begins. Gentlemen, I've heard all the arguments, and because of the lack of evidence substantiating the complainant's claim of assault, I will at this time dismiss the case. Court adjourned. My name's Paul Armstrong. Donald Collister. I know. Harvard, 65. Notre Dame, 72. Good prosecutor likes to know who he's going up against. Uh, but then again, so does any good lawyer. I brought you my schedule of witnesses. Medical experts, clergy. Judge Muir asked to bring Mason and Hanif in as parties instead of witnesses. That upset you. Depends on why. Well, that way the court can order any treatment or discontinuance of treatment, uh, depending on what the final decision is, without having to issue an injunction. You agree? Sounds reasonable. Good. Has the word filtered down yet that you're appointed a guardian for your client's daughter until the proceeding is over? Isn't the husband always the last to know? Who is it? Daniel Coburn. Heard the name. I haven't been in the county very long, just a few months.
You'll be meeting him and the rest of the legal community pretty fast now. Coburn's a good man. From what I've heard about you, you're pretty aggressive yourself. I'm pretty easy to live with. Here's the rest of the lineup. Weinhorn for the hospital, and Ralph Poirier will handle Mason and Hanif. I'm beginning to feel a little outnumbered. Oh, uh, there's another one. Attorney General William Harland. He's, uh, batting cleanup for the state. Sherman and Sterling Law Offices. I'd like to speak to Jim Crowley, please. Hello. Jim! Yeah, Paul, what's up? Help! There's Mrs. Quinlan. Take it. Take it. It's a blessed handkerchief. Wipe your sister's brow with it. It will heal you her. Take it. Take it. It's a blessed handkerchief. Yes. They found someone trying to get into your daughter's room last night. No, but don't worry. No one gets within 100 feet of the room now. We got men at each end of the corridor and one right outside her door. Mrs. Quinlan, the mail is growing so heavy, I wonder if you might be able to come down to the office now and make arrangements to have it sent to the house from now on. I'll wait for you in the room. dark in here. She loved this time of day the most, didn't she? Yeah. I hate all this. People in the lobby. Newspapers and television. The trial coming up, all of it. I can't stand what they're doing to her. Karen is an insult to everything she wants. She'd hate just lying there like that. She'd hate not being able to do anything about it. If it was me lying there, she'd do something. <laughs> oh. 
Lodi oversleep. Lodi oversleep. Little Lodi is something you just talk about from time to time, cry about. But it will be over. This case is enough to make Solomon turn over in his grave. I'll tell you one thing. If I can't have Solomon, I'll settle for Muir. He's got a good reputation. Mm, sure he has. But think what's going to happen to it. He's going to get flack no matter which way he goes. Look at it from his point of view. He's being asked to decide whether it's allowable to let someone die by stopping extraordinary means of sustaining life. And if these means are stopped, could it be considered murder? And would it be murder with good intentions or bad? And let us not forget the various and sundry constitutional aspects of the law that our case will rest on. If we're going to win on the lower court level, it has got to be on the constitutional points. Karen's right to privacy and her right not to have her life prolonged by extraordinary means against her will. Uh -huh. Some very heavy material to deal with. <laughs> you know something? I would like to propose a toast to Judge Muir. Is there any wine left? Just enough. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> to the good judge, may he be as wise as Solomon. And as brave as Samson. And as good as the laws he watches over. Who would that be at this hour? Can't imagine. Does the Lord know that it's almost 3.30 in the morning here? The Lord does not recognize Eastern Standard Time or Pacific or Mountain Time, and I'm not about to give him time zone restrictions when he calls upon me. Sleep is something his family isn't too familiar with lately. I couldn't stop thinking about today. The trial. Suddenly I was writing, trying to pass away the hours until morning. Can I read it? Oh, it's nothing. Please? I kiss her on the cheek. She cannot feel my kiss. I look into her eyes. She cannot see me. I call her name. She cannot hear me. In my heart, I hear my Karen whisper. Remove me from this machine. Let my heart beat on its own. When it grows tired, we'll stop and I will go to sleep. Let me sleep, for I have waited long. Let me sleep peacefully. Eternally.
Oh, there's Paul Armstrong. What do you think your chances are? If you lose, will you appeal? If the Quinlans win, will they pull the plug and kill the girl the same day? Please, please. Just Where are the Quinlans? Leave the car, Father. We'll have someone park it for you. I'll escort you in the courtroom, ma'am. If all this fury is just because of the press. Oh, no, ma'am. It's not that. There's been a few threats from some sickies out there. But all the packages will come in from you have been gone over by the bomb squad. And so far, we haven't found anything except stuff like this. In your opinion, Dr. Mason, is there any course of treatment that would lead to improvement or cure of Karen's condition? I personally don't know of any. Well, Dr. Mason, based upon your treatment of Karen over these many months, it, it's your opinion, is it not, that she has certain brainstem function which can control respiration? That's right. She also has other senses that we're aware of, which we normally associate with being alive, isn't that so? You'll have to say yes for the record. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, excuse me. How about the sense of pain? Well, uh, that's pretty subjective. I can tell you this, when this patient is uh, stimulated with a pinprick, there is a reflex. In other words, she reacts. Yes, but on what level God only knows, I don't. Of course, you wouldn't really be able to know that unless you were able to tell you, isn't that so? Yes. So it is quite possible that she does, in fact, feel. Just as possible as not feeling. And this structure here is the cerebellum, which has to do with coordination, motor activity, along with other integrated functions. This is the critical system of the human organism. The heart, the lungs, the kidneys, all these things can be replaced by machines. This cannot by any artificial devices known to man today. Dr. Kareem. As a member of the American Neurological Society, the American Academy of Neurology, the Electroencephalographic Society, and various other neurological associations, and chief of EEG laboratories at Bellevue Hospital, in your expert opinion, can the art of medicine repair the cerebral damage that was sustained by Karen? In my opinion, no. Doctor, would you be kind enough to describe the patient as you saw her? Describe? Yes, please. Not in medical terms, but tell the court how she looked to you. Her physical appearance. The face is distorted. She sweats endlessly. Eyes closed, emaciated. Her body is drawn up tight to no more than three feet in height. This flexion in her elbow, her wrists, her fingers, they're all flexed to her chest. And her, her knees are pulled up to her chest. But not in what I would call the uh, fetal position. The feet are pulled down. As though they might be in a... Uh, yes, in a ballet position. Isn't it true, Dr. Kareen, that uh, what might be considered extraordinary today a few years from now in your field, uh, could be considered ordinary treatment. Yes, and no. So from time to time, a different weight is given in the definition of extraordinary as opposed to ordinary treatment. I respectfully object to Attorney General Highland's question. Dr. Kareen did not say there is a difference in how that criteria would be applied in a given point in time. Nevertheless, I will allow the witness to answer. Objection overruled. Let me simplify this issue once and for all, if I may. In the matter of Karen Ann Quinlan, the means employed I consider extraordinary because they serve no useful purpose whatsoever, neither to the patient, her parents, nor society. Dr. Corinne, in response to one of counsel's questions, 
You indicated that at least a factor in your determination as to what is or is not extraordinary means has to do with the quality of life. Is that correct? I did not use the term quality of life. Are you familiar with the term triage? If so, could you explain to us what you understand it to be? Triage is a term used in the military sense. Hypothetically, if an atom bomb were to hit the San Francisco area and there were two million casualties, of those who applied to a hospital for treatment, only the individuals who could survive the injury and be of some use to society later would be cared for. Others would be turned away at the point of a gun. Then a value judgment would have to be made in the performance of that particular concept, would it not? The military have defined that value very clearly. What I am speaking of is an unwritten law, or code if you will, accepted throughout the medical profession. Could you explain what that is, please? If a patient has terminal cancer involving the lungs, the liver, the brain, a physician is likely to leave orders that if this patient stops breathing, he should not be resuscitated. Likewise, a pacemaker would never be placed in a patient with heart arrhythmia. I know of no physician personally who is going to try either treatment with a patient who has no hope, no chance of survival. I think this would be the height of misuse of technology. Mr. Coburn. As court-appointed guardian over Miss Quinlan, would you care to question the witness? Yes. <coughs> yes. Uh, Dr. Kareem, would, would it be possible for you to give a mental age? Now, when I talk of mental age, I'm talking about Karen's cognitive age. Well, would it be that of a, a two-week-old infant? seven-year-old child or what? It would be inaccurate. But I would make an attempt. Do you wish me to? Yes. Please. The best way I can describe it is to take the situation of an anencephalic monster. An anencephalic monster is a child that is born with no cerebral hemisphere. The way such a child is usually diagnosed is the doctor holds it up and with a flashlight placed at the base of the infant's skull they're able to see the light shining through the eyes. What are you thinking? Kareem was wonderful today, wasn't he? All the medical people up there, he was the only one who understood. Joe? Mason and Collister said... about pain. Do you think she feels any? No. Now you're still questioning. Don't do that. You drive yourself crazy. I can't help it. I can't be sure. No one can. Not even. Not even Corrine. Oh God, dear God. I pray she feels no pain. Come on, it's time to go. Got a full day in court tomorrow. Julie works for me at the rectory. And she and Joe are very active members of the parish. So you see, there weren't just one or two occasions when we uh, talked about the problem. Joe was praying for a miracle, and I thought at the time he wasn't facing reality. Then after a while, even, he uh, saw the hopelessness of it. Is that when he spoke with you about his desire to take care of the machine? Yes, he, he preferred her not to be maintained on the respirator, but he was troubled. He asked me if he was playing God. What did you answer? I, I told him no, I, I didn't think so. 
See, there's a profound difference between killing someone and allowing her to die. Thank you, Father. Father? Father, was your advice to Mr. Quinlan uh, in regard to his not playing God, I, I think you called it, based on some sort of papal statement? It is based on Catholic tradition, Catholic morality, and Catholic theology, as well as a statement in 1957 by Pope Pius XII when a group of anesthesiologists asked for clarification as to what their role would be in the use of respirators and resuscitators. Well, the allocutio was that response whereby ordinary means must be used to sustain life, and extraordinary means are not obligatory. Well, this was in response to a specific field of medicine, was it not? Yes. So then, it wasn't even a clarification of the church's position. Well, no, I would not see it as a clarification. I have read the document. I see it as a declaration. Mrs. Quinlan, can you advise the court of any conversation you might have had with Karen in regard to extraordinary means? Objective question uh, here, say. Object, Your Honor. Mr. Coburn? I would agree with my colleagues, but I can't lose sight of the fact that I happen to be Karen's legal guardian. And this might well be the only chance I'll have in open court to hear her feelings in the matter. I will support Mr. Armstrong's question. I will deal with this as a question of probative weight rather than as a question of relevance or materiality. I will allow Mrs. Quinlan to testify as to the conversation that she had with Karen. Thank you, Your Honor. You may answer the question, Mrs. Quinlan. We discussed it on several occasions. About January of 74, the father of one of Karen's friends was dying, and we talked about it. The last time was about February of 75. A very dear friend of the family was dying of cancer, and he chose to go home rather than in the hospital with the extraordinary means. Karen was very full of life. She loved me. I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Just try and relax. Tell it the way it feels natural to you. Life was very important to Karen and very dear to her. But the way that she could live life was also very important to her. And she felt, she said, when the father of her friend was dying. She said, Mommy, please don't ever let them keep me alive that way. If I can't enjoy life, I don't want it. You have concluded that Karen's death is a certainty. That there's no hope of recovery. And further, that it's the Lord's will. Yes, sir. And to effectuate that belief on your part, you feel her life should be terminated at this point? Not, not terminated. That's not what I'm asking for. What I want, all I'm asking for is the right that my daughter be returned to her natural state. If God wants her to live for a day or a year or five years, she will. If 
he wants her to be with him, then he'll call her and she'll go to him. And she... She has that right. She deserves that right. And that's all I want. It's very simple. Mr. Quinlan, would you care to make a statement? The judge said he'd have a decision in 10 to 14 days. We'll all know a lot more then. All right, if you'll excuse on. us, please. Move back. Mrs. Quinlan, if she was your own flesh and blood, if you hadn't adopted her, would you fight so hard to get her taken off the respirator and have her die? I said make way here. Come on, give her some room. Make way here. Yes, of course we can. Thank you, Sister Naomi. You all right? <laughs> Joe! What? That was Sister Naomi. They have a baby for us, Joe. They want us to pick it up on Saturday. Oh. <laughs> Joe! A baby! Hey, did she tell you what it was? I mean, is it a boy or is it a girl? Oh, I don't know. I didn't bother that. Oh, Joe! Baby! Love her, care for her, for she comes to you as a gift from God. It's over. I have absolutely no idea which way it'll go. Can't expect too much, John. We knew going into it how tough the fight was going to be. Come and get it. I know it was a difficult decision to make. I understand his refusing the first half of the petition not to take Karen off the respirator. But the other half, why did he refuse Joe guardianship? He felt that with all the suffering Joe had gone through, the day-to-day -day anxiety a father feels, he might take it upon himself to remove Karen from the respirator. You mean, if I wanted to do that, I could have done it long ago before this. Joe is not that kind of man. I know. How do you feel about the decision? Terrible. How do you think we feel? Mr. Quinlan, are you bitter? Well, I hope not. Enough time has gone by, so about all we feel is numb. And hurt. Will you appeal? They haven't had time to think about that yet. We might do that. We have to talk about it together and with Mr. Armstrong. It's hard to stop fighting for something that you believe in. 
for somebody you love. It's very hard. I've been covering this case from the beginning. I've never seen you people angry. I mean, downright mad. Don't you ever feel that? Yes. There's anger. But some of us are able to deal with it better than others. I'm all right. I'm, uh, I'm Sergeant Turner. What happened? Why is he here? Well, it was a fight. It uh, seems there were five of them against him. They said it was your boy that started it. I didn't. He says it was them. There, uh, there are no charges. You can take him home. Thanks. It was the fight about Karen, John. Was it, John? No! Honorable Chief Justice and Associate Justices of the New Jersey Supreme Court, Learned Counsel, members of the Quinlan family. I am privileged to stand before this highest tribunal of our state on behalf of the Quinlan family whose case we base upon six points of law. Number one, that the appellant, Joseph Quinlan, should be appointed sole guardian of the person of his daughter. Two. The testimony regarding Karen's prior statement is of sufficient probative weight to compel the conclusion that she would elect to remove the futile medical measure being administered to her. Three. Appellant and his family, including his irreversibly comatose daughter Karen, have a constitutionally protected right to cause the discontinuance of treatment which Karen presently receives. Four. Failure to grant appellant's petition subjects appellant and his family, including Karen, to cruel and unusual punishment. Five, withdrawal of treatment would not constitute homicide. And finally, six, the withdrawal of medical treatment administered to Karen Ann Quinlan is the only course of action which will promote her best interests. about asking permission before you take someone's picture? I'm sorry. It could mean a lot to me getting a picture like this. I'm trying to break into the field. This could help. Good luck with the picture. Good luck to you and yours. I hope the decision turns out the way you want it to. Anyway, two months for the Supreme Court to make a landmark decision isn't that long. We've waited a lot longer for a lot less. It's been almost a year. Did it ever occur to anyone that all this waiting we've been asked to do might have a reason? I'm sure God has a reason. Oh, I'm not talking about God, but the people who think they're God and play the part. Just look at it from their point of view. If Karen should die in the middle of all of this, everybody gets off the hook. Doctors, lawyers, everybody. Here they are. Here they are. Do you feel optimistic really about the ruling from the Supreme Court today? Hey, they're making for the no, car. not optimistic. It's hopeful. It's been a long wait, and hope is all we have. Hope and prayer. Has Karen's condition altered at all? No. Uh, what will happen if the decision goes against you today? Mrs. Quinlan, I'd like to get your permission to photograph Karen in her hospital bed attached to the respirator. We don't allow pictures of Karen. My publishers have authorized me to offer you $100,000 for a single picture. No. The figure is merely a starting point. We can do better than $100,000. Yeah. 
We uh, thought it might be wisest to wait here at the hotel until we got the decision. Uh, that way the uh, Quinlan's could have some sort of privacy. But, uh, how are they going to get word of the decision? Well, Paul Armstrong will call from Trenton as soon as he receives it, which uh, brings me to my problem. Uh, do you have an office or a room somewhere where there's a speakerphone where he might take the call? Yes, my office, sir. Oh, good. Thanks. We're all here, Paul. Paul? How'd it go? What happened? It's over, Joe. It's over. They ruled in our favor. <laughs> Did you hear me, Joe? Joe! Yeah. We heard, Paul. We heard you. On both counts. Guardianship and the right to remove Karen from the respirator. How'd the vote go? Unanimous, Joe. Seven men. Unanimous in their compassion. <laughs> We'd like it done privately. In a room with just Father Tom and the immediate family. We'd like to be there to comfort her as much as possible. I'm sorry, we cannot take Karen off the respirator. I don't understand. Nothing has changed. Everything's changed. We've got a ruling from the Supreme Court of the State of New Jersey. You still afraid of legal ramifications? It's not the legal ramifications that concern me. It's the medical ones. To remove your daughter from a life-supporting treatment would be against standard medical practice. I'm sorry, I cannot do it. We got a Supreme Court ruling. We'll take Mason off the case then. It won't work, Joe. I can do that. I have guardianship, don't I? Who are you going to get to replace him? Whoever replaces him will have to receive approval of the hospital administration in order to practice there. Simple, Joe. Anyone, Kareen, anyone else who is willing to take care and off the respirator will find it difficult, if not impossible, to get hospital approval. Well, we'll have Karen transferred to another hospital. I've looked into that. There isn't a hospital around willing to take her in order to act as an agent in her death. They're all afraid of the publicity. 
It's been six weeks since the Supreme Court decision. Six weeks since we won. Won what? Or who? Maybe the papers. You think? I don't think so. We might pick up the kind of publicity that could hurt us. Parents pushed to kill daughter as soon as possible. Any headlines like that, and we'll never get the hospital to change their mind. We're going to have to work quietly. From within the structure of St. Clair's Hospital, no matter how hard. Maybe try and force a meeting with the Ethics Committee. I can tell you right here, right now, that the Board of Trustees, of which I'm the head, will never agree to take Karen off the respirator. This is a Catholic hospital. We believe in miracles here. But sister, we've got legal grounds for our request. We've also got moral grounds. The church backs us in our decision. Our own priest and the bishop. We have got a right. You've seen her. She isn't the sleeping beauty that the newspapers picture. You must know she's not going to just walk out of this hospital one day. Won't you see that? This is a religious institution of mercy and of healing. At St. Clair's, we love our patients. We do not kill them. I'm not asking anybody to kill my daughter. But I don't want anybody putting themselves in a position that's higher than the Supreme Court and the church I love. All I'm asking is that you give back life to her mother and hope to my other two children. But most of all, I demand the return of human dignity to my daughter Karen in death as well as in life. And I charge you, sister, as a woman of the church, to return her to her natural state, to give her back to God. Mr. Quinlan, just a moment, please. I would like to talk with you and your wife, Mr. Armstrong, also, for just a moment. The doctor's lounge, please. I understand how you both feel. I feel your need. We spoke after you left the meeting. Sister Mary Luke, Dr. Mason and I feel the same. There are medical standards that we... We've been all through that before. I would like to try and wean Karen from the respirator. You tried that at the very beginning. You said that it couldn't work then. I would like to try again. Now? Why now? Why not during the ten months of, of legal procedures? If you can do it now, why didn't you do it sooner? Why now? Because all of us are at the end of the road. And I don't know what else to do, what else to try. I don't know if I can succeed. All I can promise is that I'll do everything within my power this time. I ask for your trust. And your permission. Uh, just as long as everyone understands that as the doctor in charge, I will put Karen back on the respirator if she shows any sign of not surviving the weaning procedure. Then we'll be right back where we started. I'm sorry, I can't help that. That's Please, the way... Please, doctor. We hope Karen will survive the procedures. When she is off the respirator, you will not have any further use for me, and I'll be off the case gracefully. From there on, any further problems will have to be handled by Dr. Mason, and not by me. I will have done my part. I think this situation needs to be finished. For you, for Karen, for all of us. It is time that this is finished. If you can do it, it would solve it all. Then try, Dr. Hanif. Just go ahead. Try.
I just spoke with Dr. Hanif. He hasn't changed his mind. He's going to wean her in the morning. What if she dies? What if she lives? Either way, she's at the end of it. And so are we. Now she'll truly be in God's hands. Thy will be done. It's her birthday in ten days. She'll be twenty-two. I want her to live. Thank you for trusting me. Well, the fact that Karen was able to be off the machine for one hour today might mean she may be able to go without it for two tomorrow. Three the next day, then twelve, and on and on. She'll be able to live without the respirator. I feel quite sure of that. For how long? There's no way to know. I was thinking of John. I can't wait to see his face when we tell him. Time is the circumference of our lives. Earth begins our time. Death will end our time. we look to that time that is timeless. God gave us time to love you and to care for you. And when it is time, he will take you home. And we will let you go. Happy birthday, Karen.